All right, so now we're in the notes number four, the PDF, um, which is on uh, stacking velocity analysis, normal move out, or NMO, and velocity spectra. Uh, this is on uh, page 193 of the original notes. Um, since uh, this year, uh, we've got a lot of uh, interest in um, migration. Uh, we need to go through this before we get into uh, slant stacking and, and the radon transform. That's fundamental to tomography. And I think before I go into slant stacking, um, I will reprise the material from 706 um, on um, uh, splitting and full separation, operator splitting. So uh, we'll have a little bit of that. Uh, um, later this week. So um, we've explained how the um, the full um, wave equation, the full acoustic wave equation for our 2D world, we can break it down and do downward continuation um, ignoring velocity problems. We can do downward continuation with a double square root equation and this double square root equation is either simple uh, in S and G space, but then we run into all kinds of problems with uh, velocity, as I described last time, or it's somewhat more complicated in um, H, uh, big H and, and uh, big M space. Uh, the mid the midpoint angle, the uh, dip angle in a uh, common offset section, um, big M, and the uh, Big H, the uh, normal move-out angle, the uh, as if you want to call it dip in a uh, CMP gather. So um, what we saw is that uh, uh, we could reduce that um, that double square root equation in in you know even the complicated one in, in M and H, we could reduce that to a simpler equation, which was called SEP for a separable. Uh, seismic processing equation. And the SEP basically implements three procedures. It implements uh, NMO correction and stacking. It implements uh, zero offset migration. And it implements time to depth conversion. So uh, that's uh, quite, uh, quite simple. And um, uh, this is a process that's been used for many decades now. So um, it's, it's a good time now to explore. Uh, you know, last time I explained uh, when we can use that uh, separable uh, equation, SCP, when either uh, big H or big M is uh, 0. Uh, and that allows that uh, process to be uh, uh, to be exact, but the SCP, uh, as we know, it's been used very effectively for so long. Um, and what is it good for? And what it's really good for is thinking about velocity and getting some velocity data. So it's worth examining now um, how we get that information and, and what it means. So this uh, standard hyperbolic NMO stacking over offset, it's, uh, it's useful. I mean, this is not so crucial anymore, but it does take our our three D data set, you know, from a two D world into a you know that, this is a data set over a parameter space. That's um, you know the two parameters S and G or M and H. They're they're both on the same axis, so it's kind of a difficult parameter space to visualize uh, until you've got some experience implementing. Uh, uh, field surveys, actually. Um, and it takes that parameter space and reduces it by uh, one or two orders of magnitude in size and one axis in dimension and reduces it down to a zero offset section. And that's uh, an approximation of a, uh, a cross section in, in X and Z, or M and Z. But it's uh, uh, and it's only an approximation, but at least it's on the right axes. Okay, so it, it uh, stacking is really the uh, 
the process that takes us out of the parameter space, which is a data space, and puts us into a model space. So it's the simplest way for us to do modeling, basically. Um, for us to invert our, our reflection data for an Earth model. Really the, the, the simplest way. Uh, and I'm talking about real reflection data that's multi-offset and not just um, you know, single channel marine surveys that are already in uh, uh, zero offset uh, uh, sections. So, so the good things about it, you know, it's reducing the data volume and putting it onto, um, um, putting it onto axes that, that we can relate directly to the real world, our model space. It, it implements a part of the full DSR operator. So it's an approximation to the wave equation. It's not just pulled out of thin air. It actually does something you know, that, is, that, that could be thought of as an inversion. And it's based in physics. It's not based on statistics or um, uh, or on on you know improper uh, descriptions of the physics. It's based on realistic descriptions of the physics. Um, what it does statistically is that uh, the stacking process, uh, as we learned in in seven oh six, it. Uh, the stacking process will give us uh, a reduction of noise and an enhancement of coherent signal. Okay, we're going to uh, examine uh, signal noise relationships going through these uh, these linear operators like uh, stacking, NMO correction and stacking, and and other operators, and what happens to uh, to signal over noise, and what constitutes signal. That's another. That's another uh, set of lectures that we'll get to. Um, and then maybe the, the key thing here is that um, this uh, hyperbolic stacking provides velocity estimates. Okay. Um, and that, uh, um, that is uh, um, something that we'll find to, uh, very useful. Now, as, uh, uh, as you guys have been experiencing, um, looking at uh, common image gathers and, and uh, you know, shot gathers from San Emilio, um, sometimes you, you kind of expect that uh, you're not going to be able to tell anything about what's in the cross-section until, you uh, uh, until you've done stacking of some kind. Um, now that's a pretty lousy data set, and we're hoping for better, especially from Santa Medio, uh, and we think we can see better. Um, but uh, you know, until our stacking turned up nothing, that's that was our indication that the uh, the common image gathers we had were were not uh, not worth looking at. So um, you know, stacking is the acid test. If you can't see anything after stacking, then uh, uh, something's gone wrong. Um, hopefully you see things before stacking, but um, you might you might not. Okay, well, of course, stacking introduces problems. It incorporates a velocity model, which is basically basically an interpretation into further processing. So a stack is a hypothesis, and um, it's it's not a final a stack. Even even a pre-stack migration, uh, you know, fully done with 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 uh, you know full anti-aliasing and velocity model control and uh, you know dip move out, um, all of that. It's it's an attempt to approximate the uh, the true model. It's never um, it's never the final product. And any um, any seismologist, any geophysicist who takes a uh, a stack and says, "Okay, this is it. There's nothing nothing further uh, that could be done," um, you shouldn't take their word for it. All right. The because it incorporates the velocity model, the stack is very directly a hypothesis, and in science, hypotheses are there to uh, to be. Tested negatively. 
<clears throat> and that's your uh, that's your duty when you have uh, uh, an interpretation like a stack. Um, of course, the stacking process itself assumes zero dip, and you know we wouldn't be we wouldn't have collected the data if we thought that the dip was zero everywhere. So there's a there's a pretty severe tautology there. Um, stacking also eliminates um, if it works well, it eliminates all the S wave data, it eliminates all the service wave data, it eliminates uh, the first arrival data, including their travel times. Um, it eliminates you know ninety percent, ninety five percent of the data you have in your in your seismic uh, 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 data set. So it gets rid of ninety percent of the data you've collected. Um, so again, it's just one hypothesis, and I'm pointing out it's from part, a small part of the data. All right. Now, typically, we accomplish stacking using Ray equations, um, and we follow, uh, you know, in 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 H and T space, we follow hyperbolic summation paths through uh, common midpoint gathers. Um, but now we know that we already have programs and, and wave equations uh, that are implemented in those programs uh, that we could use for stacking just, just as well as uh, uh, the, the ray equations, the typical methods. And I don't think it's been well tested. Uh, perhaps there are situations and data sets that could benefit from that. Um, of course, the ray equations and the conventional uh, operators are, are very well tested, very well seasoned, very flexible, and it would take a lot of work to get the, uh, the wave equation stacking to, uh, uh, to work as well. Um, but I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't exclude the possibility that uh, uh, there are data sets that could benefit from it. Uh, the wave equation methods should be pretty robust um, in, um, in, ter in, in terms of dealing with velocity variations. So, you know, perhaps lateral velocity variations uh, uh, could be handled uh, better by um, uh, stacking using, using wave equations. Um, however, um, all data sets that we can collect, that we're capable of collecting, are, are truncated. And most of our data sets include traces that we've edited out. You know, they're unevenly spaced in effect. Uh, they may have been collected over a winding road. Uh, and so the ray methods are, you know, they don't blow errors and truncations out across the entire uh, record uh, the way that, that at least Fourier domain methods do. So um, the ray methods are more robust in the presence of truncated data. OK, so uh, a little uh, refresher on normal move out. Uh, it makes the traces look like zero offset traces. It's a normal move out correction. Uh, it's only to, uh, to time. So here we have a wave field uh, P, which is, uh, this is a, uh, uh, a common midpoint gather. So we'll just think about one common midpoint gather. And uh, that wave, that's a, a wave field. And it's uh, the pressure, um, wave pressure P, as a function of half offset H and time T. And after NMO, what do we have? We still have a common midpoint gather, but it's all been corrected so, uh, from multi offset to zero offset. So every trace in that common midpoint gather has been corrected from that trace's uh, possibly non zero offset. To be to represent a trace that would be recorded at zero offset, and and thus uh, I I like to call zero offset time tau uh, instead of t to indicate that um, that we have um, we have corrected the time to be the zero offset time um, of whatever reflector. So um, here's uh, here's the uh, uh, the NMO correction for a constant velocity medium. All right, so uh, 
uh, the zero offset time squared is equal to the time t squared, the, the total two-way time squared, or the multi-offset time squared, minus the half offset squared over the velocity squared, the constant velocity. Note that uh, um, that uh, tau is uh, is equal to in this in this cross section on the right, tau is equal to z over v. Okay, so the, as you as you might expect, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, it's the uh, uh, one way time uh, down. So um, we have a trace out here at offset h, and we think of an exploding reflector, okay? And it's going to send a wave up to that offset. You know, here's the midpoint um, m, and we're half offset h away. So it sends the wave up at a at a slant, and uh, you know that's going to uh, that the length of that path is uh, v times t. Um, and then we correct that t to tau, which would be the time that that wave would be received from that same exploding reflector straight up, straight above at zero h. Okay. Now uh, you may be familiar with uh, the fact that when you apply NMO to a common midpoint gather, it stretches the time axis, especially near the the first arrival. Uh, it it moves the asymptote of reflection hyperbolas to a horizontal line. So here's a common midpoint gather. It's got some hyperbolas. I've tried to make these hyperbolas uh, all um, asymptotic to the same constant velocity. And so we have a, uh, a direct, that asymptotic velocity is the, the direct p arrival. And then here's a, an upper reflector, middle one, and a deeper one. Okay, all asymptotic the same velocity. So imagine that we printed out that uh, common midpoint gather on a sheet of, uh, of rubber, um, and uh, and then we stretch these lines up to be flat, like this. So uh, uh, you see what happens here. Uh, you know, near t equals h over v. Okay, the um, um, uh, the uh, the data near the uh, near the first arrival, right? Like this this reflection here, right where it meets uh, the asymptote, you know, that's over here. That's the middle reflector, and somehow we're gonna we're supposed to take that one time sample that's in there, and and stretch it out. You know, that one that one time sample is supposed to represent this reflector, which is a you know non-zero time below that reflector, which is a non-zero time below the the stretched out uh, h over v. Yeah. I have a question. Does it stretch out time near the zero offset, or does it contract time near the far offsets? Uh, it NMO correction uh, does um, at at h equals zero. NMO correction does nothing. Yeah. Okay. So then, it, more like it contracts. It it, it stretches. Access, it right? stretches. It stretches time. So these. Oh, oh, well, what happens is the uh, look at look out here, okay, yeah, out there, the time the time is going to be less. Tau is less than t. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but um, you know, one infinitesimal um, time less than the the t I was pointing to is stretched out to be way above. So you basically have one. One time sample that's stretched into over this whole range of, of tau. Okay, I see. I see what you mean. I guess what I was, the way I was visualizing it was, it, if you contract the time axis in the further offsets, it's going to flatten the line so you can stack it. But you mean you you stretch out the actual hyperbolic curve to a flat. Line. Right, right. It's I mean it's nonlinear as you can see. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's according to that uh, h over v squared. Um, and so that's where we get the uh, this this stretch. Mm -hmm. Of course, that stretch, you know, results from from the you know this this ray equation method, this physical domain method of uh, of 
computing um, the uh, the NMO correction. If the stretch doesn't happen, it, it, it's effectively still there, but it doesn't. It's not so severe when you use a wave equation NMO and, and stack. When you migrate that uh, that uh, common midpoint gather. So the 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 data near the first arrival have an artificially low frequency after NMO. And you may have seen that in, you know, for shallow reflections. Um, you can carry out NMO along any slice of the data volume. Uh, and the data volume can be sorted in, in terms of M and H. It can be sorted in terms of S and G. Uh, but everywhere, for every trace, every trace in that data volume, in that multi offset data volume, has an H, you know, and you should be able to figure out what it is. And as soon as you have that H, you can carry out NMO. And the, the NMO on, on one trace, when we use the Ray equation, can be entirely independent of the NMO on another trace. And here's the, the difference between operating with uh, uh, Ray equations or wave equations. You know, when we use the Ray equation, every trace in this common midpoint gather is stretched separately. And it's fully split from every other stretch. And that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, the way that we implement the wave equation, and we would implement the wave equation NMO correction and stacking, we need a coherent and evenly spaced CMP gather. Um, and that, that coherent CMP gather then, of course, the, uh, you know, one of the first things we might do if we're going to do an FK uh, migration of the CMP gather, then we would take a, a horizontal Fourier transform over that CMP gather, as well as a time Fourier transform. And so then you know, the whole gather has to be done, done together. And the sorting matters, right? It would be, um, it's, you can't do NMO of a shot gather um, using a Ray equation. I'm sorry, you, you can do an NMO of a shot gather using a Ray equation, but you can't do it of a shot gather using a wave equation method. So maybe that's another reason why the Ray equations are, are uh, predominant in the, uh, in the traditional use of NMO. Certainly easiest to understand in CMP gathers. So John, if you were to take the power spectra across that model you showed up there earlier, did it would actually change after NMO? Uh, yeah, it's a Right, just like. Um, Could you just do some kind of match filter to correct? Oh yeah, yeah. There's all kinds of great, you know. Okay. Th this this is all stock and trade, you know, in in every seismic processing system, well except mine. So it can be. Okay. ViewMat has no correction. It can be corrected pretty pretty quick. Yeah, but but you got to watch out because if you if you if you if you use a match filter, you're in effect predicting what the frequency should be. And you know, out here, there's really no data to separate those, those two reflections, for instance. So sure, you can, you can apply a match filter, you can make a prediction, and you can get it. But that, that's yet another interpretation, right? So um, uh, on the other hand, if you just do a low cut filter, so even in ViewMat, you know, you could do your NMO correction, then you could do a low cut filter, right? And then you're just taking out the the data that's uncertain, and that's that's not so bad of a, uh, you know, that's that's a less severe, less restrictive hypothesis. Um, but certainly, you know, if you have a large data set, you know the area very well, you got well logs to match, you could probably do it. A superb job of reconstructing those near surface NMOs, NMO stretches. Yeah. But bear in mind, you know, another hypothesis. Everything we're doing, we're layering one hypothesis on another. And uh, it's, it's common, and we learn a lot from it. We show, we decide, we disprove the hypothesis at the bottom of the stack, and we got to start all over again. That's why. Um, that's why we have processing flows, you know, change the hypothesis at the beginning, and you know, hopefully in less than three hours, the final result comes out. <laughs> okay, 
uh, NMO is a linear operator. Okay. Now, how about this? This is a new concept, maybe. Uh, Ray equation NMO, you can implement by matrix multiplication. How about that? Okay. So uh, uh, what that, and here's the result of that here. I, I'm going to give you the, the final result. Uh, let's say um, your data set, your multi-offset data set, here sorted into shock gathers, P of S, G, and T. Let's say it's the combination of two data sets. Um, you know, let's say there's, uh, there's line one and line two. Or let's say there's the low frequencies and the high frequencies. Or let's say there's one data set that contains the large amplitudes and one data set that contains the near zero amplitudes. You can split up your data any way you want. Maybe, um, maybe it's the early times and the late times. Okay. All right. Then, because NMO is a linear matrix multiplication operator, the NMO of P is going to be equal to the NMO of P1 plus the NMO of P2. Perfect linearity. All right. Uh, and and you know any decomposition works. Um, you know you can have ranges on SGT or MH and T. Um, Amplitude, Fourier components, all of that. So the you can uh, uh, with this linearity, all right, you can invert the NMO operator. Okay, so P of tau is equal to the NMO operator applied to P of t. P of t is equal to the inverse NMO operator applied to P of tau. All right. Uh, and we'll we'll examine more uh, perhaps later uh, when we when we talk about these uh, these kinds of, of linear operators these kinds of matrix multiplications um, when we talk about how convolution is a linear operator this way um, how um, uh, stretching and and truncation uh, all of those things are linear operators NMO is is an, is another example it's a very common one it has um, what are essentially interpolation filters uh, along the uh, diagonal, and it's zero uh, when you're well off the diagonal. Um, I, I, I typically use an NMO operator that's uh, uh, just bi-diagonal. Um, it'll you know you 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 get a uh, it's output based, so you you look for a uh, you look in the data t for a. Uh, 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 you have a particular time tau in your output, and you calculate some time t that you go and look for in your data, and it's always between two data points, and so you interpolate between those two data points, those two time points. So that leads to a bidiagonal uh, interpolation filter. <coughs> so um, uh, you know that's a that's a pretty simple uh, uh, filter to invert. Uh, and of course, you're you're aware that that may, the subject of matrix inversion is 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 you know full of uh, of issues of its own, uh, and so there will be conditions, uh, there will be NMO uh, that uh, can't be inverted very well. There's going to be null space. There's going to be inconsistent data. All those issues will uh, will arise, um, but uh, um, you know. Knowing that you can represent NMO in this simple linear operator way, then you know right away there's an inverse, and um, uh, and in fact uh, I can give you forward and inverse NMO codes, um, and and you know all you have to do is is look at the defining travel time equation to figure out how to do that inverse. Right, it's uh, not uh, not that difficult. <clears throat> okay, now what about you know the much more common situation, unlike uh, constant velocity that's so easy for us to write down, the more common situation where uh, we have velocity that varies strongly with depth z. So um, and and of course this also means that velocity varies strongly with tau. Okay. Um, and our data begins in t, and so 
we're we're going to you know not yet do depth conversion, and we're going to talk about velocity varying with tau, with tau as a proxy for depth. So uh, when dip is zero, okay, that's of course one of the qualifications here. We're assuming dip is zero, which is ridiculous, but we have to. Um, we have tau squared is equal to t squared, as we did before, minus h squared over not just v, but something I ca I'll call the stacking velocity or the NMO velocity, uh, which depends on tau. So the velocity depends on tau, and of course that's squared. And this is uh, you know this is what's actually implemented in in all the uh, NMO correction codes. Um, so the stacking velocity is thought, and uh, Hewitt Dix in his book proves that for you know not. A pretty good range, but but not not a large range of offset for near zero offsets, uh, and near enough is probably thirty degrees uh, incidence angle. For near zero offsets, V stack is is very close to the what's known as the RMS velocity. And here is a, uh, a badly annotated uh, equation for calculating RMS velocity from interval velocities V. Uh, which vary with with uh, zero offset two way time tau, um, and uh, it gives you a uh, a, z a zero offset uh, a RMS average velocity which uh, uh, varies with uh, uh, with time tau. So here it's a it, uh, the annotation is saying it's a it's we're calculating the RMS velocity for a particular time tau one, and we're going to do that by summing from for tau's uh, equal to zero to tau one, uh, tau's equal to from zero to uh, tau one, okay, and and uh, over velocities uh, uh, that uh, uh, are in uh, are in layers. So the Dix equation, as you might uh, know it, is the inverse. Essentially, it undoes the velocity averaging. Uh, and the R, note that the RMS velocity is corrected for time, so it's really, you know, it's not a straight average. Um, you know, if you, if you think about, uh, you need you need to move away from thinking about arithmetic averages of velocity, because it doesn't work. The the high velocity values, you know, bias the arithmetic average, uh, so that your your arithmetic average of velocity. Is always higher than than an average of velocity that you want to use, like VRMS. Okay, it's going to be lower than you think because it, RMS velocity is always going to be lower than the arithmetic average of velocity. Uh, in the same way, you know, in in civil engineering and uh, building codes, they define a um, a time average velocity. Um, and the one used in the U.S. Building Code is uh, the shear velocity time average from the surface to uh, 30 meters depth. And uh, I've spent uh, a lot of my career recently, uh, you know, measuring that and characterizing it. And that's all. That's another one of these averages that is always lower than the arithmetic average of velocities. Even the weighted arithmetic, you know, even when you weight the arithmetic average by the, the layer thicknesses, um, it's always lower. And the same is true of the RMS velocity. Okay, so um, uh, let's say we get a, uh, a stretched uh, CMP gather Q. Um, which is uh, uh, it's got it's on uh, h and z axes, and that's equal to the uh, NMO filter uh, applied, the NMO operator applied to our uh, CMP gather, which is just p of h and t. All right, and we have um, uh, uh, we have a we write a function where z is a function of h and t. So NMO is a map, mapping, you know, just like the omega stretch in Stolt migration, best implemented on an output-based uh, uh, procedure. Okay, 
So Q of H and Z is really Q of H and Z is a function of H and T, and that's taken from uh, um, uh, P of uh, H and T. And as we're uh, examining points in the H and Z domain to find what maps there from uh, H and T, okay, what we what we are really doing is we're we're taking, you know, we're we're writing a function for time. We're writing the opposite of the function we thought we were, you know, to make it an output-based mapping. So we go to a point we want to fill in the output, which is Q, and that's at a particular z, and we end up looking up a time t, uh, which is a function of h and z. So to um, to do NMO correctly, suddenly we find that that what we need is a, uh, a function that gives us the travel time for a certain half offset and a certain z. Okay, So we want to find the travel time from depth z at half offset h through the velocity model. Okay, And let me just remind you what this exploding reflector model looks like here. Okay, So there it is. And um, So suddenly, this uh, uh, this this mapping, which could be uh, very very difficult, uh, it doesn't it doesn't require us to do a full ray tracing. We don't need to know where the ray goes in between the exploding reflector and the and the offset um, receiver. Okay, all we need to know is the time it takes, and that allows us to to write the function. Uh, t of uh, as a function of h and z. Okay, so uh, we don't need to do ray tracing. We can use Vidali's travel time code from his 1988 uh, paper. I think that's in uh, BSSA, if I remember right. Um, so later on, I will also talk about uh, Vidali's travel time code and. Uh, how uh, you can very rapidly and uh, uh, deterministically determine these uh, uh, these these times. Okay, true ray tracing, um, and that you know ray tracing is still done, especially for tomography, because there you, with tomography you want to know the path. But true ray tracing is not a deterministic algorithm; it's an inversion. You have to at least use Newton's method, and there's many more, you know, um, you know, effective ways of ray tracing, but uh, they're all, you know, thousands and millions of times slower than uh, Vidali's method. Vidali's method uh, in 2D, it takes uh, you have a uh, a 2D velocity model that's broken up into cells, okay, with a velocity value for each cell. Vidali's method takes one square root per cell. That's it. And you get the, you deterministically get the time out from a source to to every cell. So here, obviously, you would put the the source at the uh, at the uh, exploding reflector there, and you would get the times along the surface. Um, but of course, you have to calculate the times to every cell in between. <clears throat> So we, we have now some very convenient ways of, uh, uh, you know, even, even in 3D velocity models, and Satish has probably got the best code for determining travel times in, in 3D. You know, Vidali started, um, it wasn't entirely satisfactory, and then uh, Optim improved, improved uh, on that code by, by uh, considerable measure. So uh, you know, even in extremely complex velocity models in three dimensions, um, <coughs> we can uh, we can accomplish uh, we can solve that travel time problem. Now, what's down here is are some ways of of solving the problem uh, using the traditional ray tracing approach. Uh, you know, it's by essentially integrating through velocity as a function of tau. Um, and uh, and and this shows the approach of you know we uh, we shoot off a ray at a certain uh, ray parameter which means a certain angle from the uh, the exploding reflector source and um, 
So we try this angle, and we've overshot the H. We, uh, uh, using Newton's method, we might try a slightly smaller angle. And you know, here we haven't over, we were overshooting the H a little bit different. You know, the next attempt would probably undershoot the H, and so we have to converge down in. Okay, and this, uh, you know, this can work, uh, but we don't need that. We don't need that whole path, as it turns out. Um, and uh, uh, if um, if our lateral velocity variation is slow, so that our you know the the lateral derivative of velocity is about zero, then um, you know once we uh, once we compute this table, which we can do very quickly with uh, um, uh, with Vidali's code, uh, we can use it uh, to NMO um, any gather uh, that has the same range of. Uh, of t and, and h. So basically, we're building a table of times versus h and tau. Okay. Uh, so that's a travel time table. And my uh, my Kirchhoff migration routines, especially my uh, CMIG routines uh, or LATMIG routines, uh, they use uh, this idea. They assume uh, uh, laterally invariant velocity, and uh, and the first thing you do is you feed it the travel time table. Okay. Now we still, you know, we still have not uh, addressed this issue that we don't know the velocity. Okay. Everything we've done here depends on the velocity. So, because of the dependence of everything we've done, uh, the dependence of of NMO correction stacking on velocity, we can determine uh, we can determine velocity. We can determine velocity as a function of tau. From the data, and this, of course, is is the way most reflection data is attacked at first. Um, Satish was really the first one to to use uh, velocity inversions to process the data um, without having to go th go through um, NMO uh, uh, velocity spectra, okay, to determine velocity, okay. Um, and, and of course, there's a problematic relation between v as a function of tau, and and v as a, a function of um, of uh, x and z in the presence of dip. Okay, that was the That was the problem that uh, uh, that Satish actually solved by avoiding uh, NMO correction uh, entirely. Okay. Um, so assuming that, that velocity doesn't vary too much laterally, uh, uh, but uh, uh, then we can still uh, determine v as a function of tau. Okay, um, and and in the presence of dip, we can do it as well. So the procedure, as you're probably aware, is that you NMO and stack your common midpoint gather at a range of constant velocities. Okay, so um, basically uh, we we begin with a an M and H sorted data set, and so this this data cube here, the front face, is the first common midpoint gather, and as you slice you know further back into that into that data set, uh, you're just looking at different common midpoint gathers around different midpoints M. Okay. Uh, and looking at this this front common midpoint gather, you see a a uh, hyperbola asymptotic to a low velocity, and then some hyperbolas asymptotic to higher velocities. Oh, and then at uh, uh, down here, you see a uh, a multiple in green. This is indicating a multiple hyperbola that is uh, asymptotic to that lower velocity, but too deep. Okay, so. Um, um, what we're going to end up with, okay, every time we uh, we NMO and stack, right, we've collapsed we've collapsed the H axis, so we collapse it to an MT, the NMO and stack at one at one velocity, okay, collapses uh, the uh, the the our three D you know multi offset data volume to a two D 
M and T zero offset section. Okay. So if we, uh, what we're really doing is we're transforming the H axis to a velocity axis. So we transform at one velocity, we get a 2D section, and we put that section, we hang it from the V axis, okay, at the velocity it, where it belongs. Okay, it's a it's a zero offset stack section. All offsets are zero in this transformed data set, transformed data cube. Okay, notice that the uh, the horizontal axis pointing into the screen is still m. Uh, the vertical axis is still time, but now it's zero offset time tau. Okay, simple enough, right? Here's time t. There's tau right there, a little bit less. Okay, so now the time axis is tau. Uh, yeah. Would that be like a semblance cube, essentially? Yes. Yes. That's the. Is that is that the term that's uh, you've heard most often? Yeah, well, like whenever you do the velocity semblance picks, you always pick it on like a slice of the, the CMP versus the velocity spectrum and time. Mm -hmm. And you just pick out the areas of highest coherency, and that's what it uses to stack. Right, and coherency is kind of what I've contoured in here. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, so what we're looking at here in this front face, instead of looking at a CMP gather, we're looking at a, um, it's at a, it's at some midpoint. Okay, the first midpoint, and we're looking at at semblance or or uh, or uh, we could look at the stack wave field. We could look at semblance. We could look at coherency. Um, and what I'm indicating here is is coherency or semblance uh, is contoured, um, and it's semblance versus tau and velocity. Okay, so zero offset time and velocity. So you run down here and you connect the uh, the peaks, right? And you get a, a function of velocity versus tau, and that's what you needed, right? That's the function you need to be able to stack the data. Now, in my in my um, um, in my four ninety two exercise, okay. Um, Looking at shallow data sets, um, the uh, the semblance slices don't look very good. Okay, so I have them interpret velocity using the left and right sides of the semblance cube. Those are constant velocity stacks. Okay, because they have axes m and tau, and each one is at a different velocity. So so for uh, uh, for lousy especially shallow land data, um, you, you, it's very rare to get a, uh, um, an interpretable um, velocity spectrum, which is what the front face of this cube is sometimes called, and much easier to interpret velocity off the few reflectors you have in the constant velocity stacks. Again, the left side, the right side are constant velocity stacks. P tau? The V tau. Velocity tau domain those slices. Oh, um, yeah, you'd have to resort the uh, uh, the data, but it would it would uh, or the output of the of the CV stack. Uh, so it might not. I th there's not a direct way, but uh, you could do it. You can do it in SPW. Yeah. No. Of course, of course. <laughs> can you use those results? So you can think of the of the constant velocity NMO and stacking as a transformation from offset space H to velocity space V. Uh, and what kind of velocity is it? Well, it's it's formally just NMO velocity or stacking velocity, uh, which we think is it's it's not interval velocity, it's not real velocity, it's stacking velocity, which is close to uh, probably the uh, um, the um, RMS velocity. Um, so the uh, you know we begin with uh, our wave our multi offset wave field, p of m h and t. We do uh, CV stacks. Uh, 
or, or we calculate velocity spectra or the, the whole velocity cube, and we end up with this Q, this interpretation volume, this velocity um, cube, uh, which is in M, V stack, and tau. Uh, now, we know also that everything we learned about zero offset migration, because we're using this, this very, very similar equation, uh, to, you know, to do the, uh, uh, you know, or we could use this very similar equation to do the, the NMO correction stacking, right? Everything we know about this operator from zero offset migration, now we, we know is also going to apply to um, NMO correction and stacking and, and to velocity transformation. So, so really, the, velo the velocity transformation the uh, getting the velocity space is just a migration, okay. And this this constant velocity volume is is not that large anymore, um, and uh, uh, so we probably could invert it. Um, um, but as we'll see uh, uh, later on, um, despite the difficulties that we get with inverting a CV stack, the uh, the CV stack, um, the inverse of CV stack, is very, very close to what you'll come to uh, to see as the adjoint or the transpose of CV stacking. Okay, and and what you do there is you have the same program, but you change a sign to compress the stretch traces, right? Uh, and you may remember this from your your uh, work in a in a 706 lab on on migration on uh, Stolt migration, right? You had an equation kind of like this, and you um, you wanted to uh, uh, you know this this is the forward equation. You wanted to invert that and write a uh, a reverse equation, and if you exchange t and tau, uh, the only thing you have to do to to get the, the inverse equation is change that minus to a plus, right? So, um, you know, a, you, can, you can take your, and, and I have a, uh, 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 an NMO correction stacking program where the inverse, uh, the inverse CV stack is accomplished just by changing the sign and restacking it. Okay? That's using, that's using the, um, um, the transpose of the of the program to uh, to accomplish the inverse, and we'll we'll look later at this issue of how close is the transpose to the inverse. There are some very useful uh, routines where the the transpose is exactly the inverse. Uh, and just to give you a preview, I'll reveal that that the most useful of those is the is the Fourier transform. The, tra the, the inverse Fourier transform is precisely a, 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 the transpose of the Fourier transform, okay? Um, and, uh, and there are others where it's, it's further, okay? And there's big problems with uh, null spaces and so forth. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, things such as idempotent transformations. So, um, uh, and, and what we what we'll see later too is, um, and when we even when we talk about uh, the slant stack, is that the only difference between a transpose and an inverse in some cases is a very simple frequency domain filter to kind of undo all the averaging that the uh, that stacking does. Okay, so just just to illustrate an example, uh, use and, this is, and as you as you can tell. This is a very old preview mat example. Um, although I keep this code around in case somebody wants to plot wiggle traces, it's also great for also great for plotting um, uh, unevenly spaced traces. Does this have an AGC applied? Yes. How yes. They, How can you tell? Well, the right before the first arrival, you get that. There's a gutter. And it really makes it easy. Satish does that. How do you? I mean, what 
what settings go in? I mean, obviously, I can see the window length. Yep. Yep. That's that's all. That's all. That's all the settings I use in applying that What's the AGC there. there. I mean, that looks really nice for picking first break. And I'd like to do that to my data, but I can't figure out the settings. Maybe we could talk about that. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, okay. The difference here. This is. Uh, uh, wait a minute. That's a calcrust spread. Uh, I'm having to look sideways at my notation here. Uh, notice uh, my notation: uh, twenty to sixty pounds at twenty to sixty feet. This is explosion data. Yeah. And and it has it for picky first arrivals. It is as you can see so much neater and nicer than correlated fiber size data. But Satish did that with the correlated fiber size, and it looks just like that. Oh, well, you just have to you know, just bring the records into ViewMat and play around with the AGC. Yeah. Would it help if you did like a mute like way above where you thought the first pick would be, and then did the AGC? So go from basically like no signal to no. Well, you can, no you can actually, in the, in the AGC, most AGCs allow you to to have a detect option where it'll it'll mute everything before the first uh, arrival, as part of the AGC routine. Because like the top of that, right for that energy pick stuff, you can see the window length. If you just went through before you did that and muted everything above there, the, the end of the AGC, well, you can only make that all. That pop noise up there more. isn't a big deal. The nice thing is the amplitude. Yeah, but right before the pick. I think it'd be a greater contrast if there was absolutely no noise. Up so 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 this. That's what you want. You want that. Th this is a this is a, a, a an offset test, and it's a uh, it's a sixty pound shot at five kilometers distance. So that's that's a further distance than you have, right? The the yeah. the maximum offset in uh, in Santa Medio for the lines you're looking at is like three kilometers. Uh -huh. You know, but this is a sixty pound shot. That's just so much better. Than uh, a couple of vibrators. Uh -huh. Now, now, where where vibrate? The reason we use vibrators is because, okay, this one record is uh, 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 has a has a great uh, has a great uh, uh, signal noise ratio, but. I've only got like five records in the whole survey because I, I could only get you know so many holes drilled and I was only physically able to load so many holes. Okay. Um, well, they don't get a stack this. This way. is the this is the uh, uh, I th you know one of these blasts. I have a picture of myself setting it off and almost blowing up a power line. So uh, you know this this uh, this data set could have been very dearly bought, but. Fortunately, I didn't make as bad of mistakes as I could have. Can you just do the one single shot here instead of ten? That's that's ten shot stacks. Right, right. That you can do with a sledgehammer or a or a whacker. Um, you know, with fiber size, you know, you get hundreds of records. Yeah. Instead of just a few, so you get your signal noise after stacking. Yeah. Okay, uh, but but. No kidding, uh, it's way harder to pick first arrivals um, when you don't have a nice clean blast like this. In Viper size, they ever just do one hard thump and just try to do that? <laughs> pick first arrivals instead of it, it, The machine can't do that. <laughs> um, I, I, I actually did a survey with, uh, with land air guns. So it's this giant bell, like a diving bell. Mounted in a vibrosized truck, and and at the bottom is a rubber mem membrane to hold on all the holding all the water. And in the water is is this you know big air gun, and so um, you know the truck lowers the bell and clamps it to the ground. So the the water above the membrane is sitting you know basically right on the ground, and then the air gun goes off and you hear this thump, and uh, that's a pretty good data set, uh, and it was easy to do uh, you know ten stacks. Um, but you know they're specialist. You know it, the the crew actually came from Bolt, so they were kind of expensive. Um, 
and that that wasn't a great data set, um, uh, but I'll I may show you some of it later on. Um, the um, uh, so so it turns out the the sources that are more repeatable. Um, I mean, look at this look at this data set. Where's the reflections? You see any reflections? <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe there, but only maybe. You know, it's just it's just shot through with uh, source generated noise. Okay, because I even though I was I was in a in a fairly deep borehole, it was nowhere near the water table. So it's just shot through with noise. Well, you get the there's probably some nasty source side goats in there. If you buried it down. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I was desperate to, uh, this is part of my thesis work, I was desperate to find some reflections. Okay? So I, tran I took this record, I transformed it into a velocity section. Okay? So here's uh, essentially uh, a kind of coherence uh, is the darkness. And uh, velocity increases to the left. Uh, we now are looking at tau down. And only zero, you know, this, this record is zero to six seconds. Um, we're going to look from zero to three seconds, okay? Transform from zero to three seconds. And, uh, you know, this is for one of the, uh, one of the midpoints. Um, actually, it was, it was done in the shot domain, but don't let that confuse you. So is, that's basically just the velocity for possibly one reflector, right? You just have that little... That little so so a, a, a hyperbola, right? Should should produce a nice clean hyperbola should produce a, a spot right yeah so you know maybe here's uh, you know a function you know if we connect these dots here we have you know higher up we have a low velocity and then a little bit deeper we have a, a somewhat higher velocity yeah that's like maybe one or two reflections right there yeah and maybe uh, maybe this is a multiple right because it's at low velocity but it's at, at larger time. Actually, it's at twice the time of this thing, so that that's got to be a multiple. If you change the gain, do you think you could possibly pick up any more reflections? Well, so what I what I did is is I I basically like squared or 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 uh, cubed. I squared the square of, of the amplitude here, you know, and used it as a as a filter. So you know, basically, I I you know these things that are dark, they're the only thing that that got inverted. Okay, and I and I you know muted out all the rest of this. Okay, I was, I was wondering why that looks so clean. Okay, so there's you know there's the reflections that I say are recovered out of that record with an inverse, wow. an inverse uh, 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 NMO, um, and you know, but notice notice I had to do of course I had to use ray equations because I had missing traces I had a data gap I I I could have filled this in right. If I'd given it the coordinates of these traces, um, you know, I could have projected my result in there, and you could see, you could guess what it would look like. This is this is an exceedingly you know, it's 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 you know, three to five percent of the data. That's it. The rest of it I've I've thrown away. Uh, you can see there are some there are still some uh, hyperbolas that are matching the surface wave, which shouldn't really happen, right? Because the surface waves are straight lines. Um, but, uh, you know, um, that was the best I could do with, uh, with this record. So I asked someone this this summer, when you're doing the filtering in the tau domain, that's not a causal filter, is it? You're adding in a, a causal energy if you're doing a view. Uh, right, right. So, so for instance, like if you just well, this is, uh, but, you know. It looks like I can see in your, your filtered record, you have an arrival at five kilometers, about 0.7 seconds. Yeah. That wasn't there in the uh, original. No, that's, that's the, that's the thing, you know, just trying to get this noise block. Yeah. I mean, so there's something there, right? There's lots of non-physical data in here. Yeah. 
thing at the top there. That yeah, like yeah. It uh, totally is. Is, so is that from the filtering it's process? probably the AGC, right? Yeah, yeah. It's just, that's just, you know, without the AGC, that wouldn't be there. And neither would anything else. <laughs> so this is the, you know, the most brutal trying to make the, uh, the data give me something. Yeah, it's it's uh, clearly uh, uh, it's probably this thing up here. Well, that's, that's kind of interesting. So that's definitely caused by the AGC. You can see yeah, this there, all this noise here. Yeah. Why is it? Why does it have like a, a move out to it? Why why is there like a velocity? Why is it not just constant noise across the top? Uh, well, first of all, I didn't allow uh, infinite velocity, right? My velo my maximum velocity. So, so that's an example of an item of the item potency of this, where but the the uh, it can't pick up, you know, my 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 velocity space doesn't have any of the um, any of the simultaneous arrivals because they're way off the right hand side or the left hand side. In the record above this record above that right there, it yeah. looks like there's still like a similar move out. To like to the noise up top. Yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, this is a, a, a filtered version of that noise, okay. filtered through this uh, NMO uh, semblance. And but so that's like the upper part of the noise, right? That, that kind of line we see up top. It's caused by the AGC. I, right? I think it, I think it's keying in on kind of a you know random lineups coming down through here, you know. If it was random, then why would it make a, like a straight line? Because it has to. You know, it's 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 finding that's the semblance. Okay. You know, it's seeing some semblance, but but yeah, you see that. Why should you trust any of these other apparent reflectors? It's recovered, right? You know, so 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 what I've done here basically with this record, I have forced, shoehorned, pounded this record into a very strict model where it's just got a few hyperbolas. And so, you know, is what I've gotten out valid or not? You know, you have to, you have to judge that. Um, there has to be some other test to do. Let's look at the stack. <laughs> well, I only had five records, so I don't have a stack. You know, the stack is, is, is not very good. You know, it's a, it's a single fold stack. Yeah, do I even have a stack in my thesis? Good grief, I can't remember. <coughs> so, uh, okay, so the, the constant S shot gather was transformed into velocity space by stacking along hyperbolic paths. Here's the, the actual equation I used. And then I picked uh, uh, each V tau point and uh, each point in, in V and tau and sum the, the uh, value of, of all the p's at h's and tau's that uh, uh, you know, were computed from that. And then here's the transformation uh, back, the, the transpose. And notice the similar, similarity between these two equations. right? This is the output. This is the input. And the, in the inverse, this is the output. This is the input. And you just change to so use the same equation, just change the sign. Same program, same equation, just change the sign. So the, the you give the program a command line uh, uh, parameter that says change the sign, do the inverse. <clears throat> so what, what questions are you trying to answer with this data set? Whether we could record uh, reflections in this environment, and so I think. My supervisor and his colleagues, they, I, I don't know, I never saw a copy of the proposal, but they, uh, they, uh, they might have taken this result here, you know, which I basically took some crappy data and I pounded it into a model, you know, like putting a square peg in a round hole, right? If you have a big enough hammer, you can do that. And, um, and they put it in a proposal and uh, NSF uh, funded it. We're talking like 1985, um, and um, 
and we did we went on and did a much bigger experiment with vibrators. Okay. So this, this was supposed to act more as a feasibility test. That's right. That's right. I wasn't supposed to get a. I wasn't supposed to. Get, I was supposed to see reflections somehow. I wasn't supposed to get a full section. Okay. So the full sections from the uh, from the the final survey, the, those are in my thesis. But uh, yeah, I don't know. You know, I should have uh, I should have recovered something down to six seconds because it was supposed to be a deep crustal survey, and I only did the you know the the basins really. <laughs> Going only only analyzing it down to three seconds. Notice there's no there's basically no hyperbolas with a tau of uh, of greater than three seconds because I didn't include I didn't I didn't do that part. Is that just due to not picking out the semblance below three seconds? It just I couldn't find any. any no, I, I just didn't calculate it. You know, my this is my whole semblance uh, section. Yeah. And I, I ended it at three seconds. But that's a two-way time, right? Yeah, but so's uh, so's this, right? And this goes down to six. Yeah. 